Well, hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of the Mayor's Community Policy Trust. My name is Dr. Coral Evans, and I am delighted to be joined today by Mayor Jen Daniels. How are you doing, Mayor? I'm great. Thanks so much for including me today. You know, I am so excited that you are here with me because uh, you and I had the opportunity to serve at the same time. You were the mayor of Gilbert, Arizona, and we sat on the league's executive committee together for several years. And um, we were just talking before the camera went on about, you know, what it's like to be a mayor. Right. And it's kind of different. And so we'll get into that a little bit as we um, have our conversation tonight. But when I saw you down at the Arizona League of Cities and Towns, I was so excited that I had the opportunity to stop you and talk to you about being on this podcast because I had you on that that little yellow sticky <laughs> note to give you a call and reach out to see if you would join us. There are no accidents. We ran into each other on purpose and uh, we did sit next to each other because we were always seated in alphabetical order yeah. and Flagstaff sat next to Gilbert. So I was really fortunate that I got to spend that time with you. Well, we are here today to talk about the concept of statesmanship. Um, this is something that grew out of my body of research for my PhD. And um, the concept of what is a statesman? How do people become statesmen? And so we're going to kind of take a walk down memory lane um, and have this conversation about how it, um, how statesmanship is interwoven with policy and what it looks like and what it doesn't look like. Um, but before we get started, I'd like to know how you became mayor of Gilbert, Arizona. Yeah, I um, still consider it one of the best jobs I've ever had. Uh, I was mayor from 2016 to 2020, and I was on the council for eight years prior to that. So I ran for office in 2008, got elected early 2009. We used to have spring elections back in those days mm -hmm. and uh, yeah, uh, just really loved that opportunity to serve on a council. Um, I was young when I first got elected and people asked me all the time what made me want to run the first time. And it wasn't that I was unhappy with my community. I didn't um, have this li list of grievances as, as some people who run often do. But I just looked at the current makeup of the council at the time and knew that from a demographic standpoint, I could represent a voice um, at that time as a young mother uh, that wasn't uh, currently represented. So I kind of took a chance. And um, again, as I've said, lots and lots of times, there aren't any accidents. I didn't have this pedigree. I didn't major in poli sci. I did not have political parents. Um, and I had only lived in Gilbert since 2005 but I ran for office and um, I won and I was, I surprised myself. In fact, I still laugh that the day after I won and I knew I was supposed to run. I, I never had like the, you're going to win or you're supposed to win moment. I just knew that I wanted to be part of my community. And the day after the election, so this is 2009, I woke up, I think I cried because <laughs> I thought now I have to do this job that I'm really not even sure I know, you know, all of the facets of, and I for sure did not. Um, and then had the privilege of serving underneath a mayor, John Lewis, who still is a great mentor and friend, just a really, really incredible human. In fact, when you say the word statesman, uh, his face pops in my brain, uh, true statesman, and had the privilege of learning underneath him. He uh, approached me knew knowing he wasn't going to run again uh, after, uh, you know, having served almost two terms. And he said, would you be willing to run? And um, probably like most women who are given an opportunity, I was like, no way, I can't. Um, I had three boys and I was, while I was in office, I had a daughter. Uh, so I had four kids. Uh, they were, you know, of school age. Uh, my daughter wasn't quite in kindergarten yet. And I said, no way. Um, I knew John Lewis put in 80 hours a week and yeah. I wasn't going to be able to do that and be the kind of mom that I wanted to be. Uh, so I said no for about six months. And then finally, I don't know what happened on the seventh month. I said, maybe I can do it. And I just started having those conversations. Uh, I was fortunate that when I did decide to run with the support of my family and John Lewis and others, um, that no one ran against me. So that did make the election part a lot easier. <laughs> Uh, but John Lewis resigned a few months early from his post uh, as mayor. And so I took over earlier than I had expected. Uh, and that that took a lot of extra energy and effort. But man, was it the best job? I mean, just such a unique position to see your community and all of the helpers 
all your faith groups and your schools and your first responders and every single staff member, whether it's, you know, part of water delivery or HR or anything, mm -hmm. the quantity of people, you know, that it takes. And I love that my kids know from my experience and them having lived it as well, that the quality of life that we have in a community is not by accident. It's intentional and it takes a lot of really good people doing good work. Spoken like a true mayor. <laughs> I absolutely love your story because I have never heard it before. Mm -hmm. You know, we came in the office, I guess, then at about the same time mm -hmm. because I came in in 2008 mm -hmm. in a spring election. Yeah. <laughs> you know, um, and then was there for two terms and then decided to run. And so I like how they asked you for six months and it was a no. And the seventh <laughs> month, well, maybe as soon as you said maybe, mm -hmm. it was just yeah. like, you know, all downhill from there. <laughs> Yeah, I had but, to wrap my brain around it. And I also had to look at my community and say, do my set of skills that I have that are different from the previous mayor, right? I'm, I'm a different human and I have different needs, but I also have different skill set. Are my skill set what's needed in my community right now? Um, and that was a really important, I think, process for me to walk through. And like you said, nothing happens by accident. So mm -hmm. I think, you know, those skill sets were exactly what your community needed at the time. I like to think so, um, but you know, we all have lots of blind spots. And mm -hmm. one of my favorite books is Leadership and Self-Deception. And just that understanding that, you know, there are gonna be things I can't see and I need honest people around me that I trust to let me know where my blind spots are so that I can find other people to augment my leadership. You know, that has me thinking about something that I was told when I, when I first ran for mayor. Mm -hmm. I went to, um, a previous mayor of Flagstaff, who I absolutely, you know, have just mad respect for, right? Mm -hmm. And I was like, I'm thinking about running for mayor. And he was like, yeah, you should. And I was like, wow. He's <laughs> like, I'm so glad you're finally thinking about this. And I was like, well, I want to be a good mayor. And so I was trying to basically kind of interview the different mayors, but I started mm -hmm. with him. I'm like, tell me how to be a good mayor, right? Or what, what do you, what did you do? Because you were a good mayor. And one of the things he said was, um, you know, you don't govern in isolation and you have six city council members. Mm -hmm. and each of your city council members will have a strength that you do not have. They'll have a knowledge, they'll have a strength, they'll have something. And they're just as passionate and love Flagstaff just as much as you do, mm -hmm. but maybe they just have a different way of doing things. And he said, you need to find out what it is that they wanna get accomplished in their term. Yeah. You know, ask them for two things. When you get done with the list, you're going to have six things. Chances yeah. are, and that's six things, you're going to have 12. Mm -hmm. And chances are all 12 of those things on that list are things that you want to accomplish too. Yeah. So one of the things you need to do is make sure they're successful because if they're successful, you'll be successful. Yeah. yeah, no, I love that. And I felt the same way. I mean, I was one of seven. And if I couldn't build a coalition, um, I wasn't going to be very successful. And uh, the goal really was to see each member of our council feel like they were contributing uh, their best work. Uh, mm -hmm. Another one of my favorite books is Multipliers, right? How do I be the multiplying effect on my, for my council? How do I take their efforts and turn it into the efforts of, you know, four or eight or 12 people through my leadership? I like that because I read that book too. Yeah, that's a good one. And like the other book I was like busy writing down, I have to get, but that one I have read <laughs> and I absolutely love it. Yeah. So let's talk about this concept of statesmanship. And just for everybody who's listening, I want to make sure that, you know, that that everyone understands that statesmanship um, is not a gender specific word. Um, for my body of research, I use the word statesmanship just like we do human. Right. Um, and down throughout history, there have been um, many women who have been considered to be statesmen. Mm -hmm. Um, I think we maybe don't hear as much as we should about those women, um, simply because up until, you know, kind of recent modern history, um, the majority of um, individuals who were in politics were men. Mm -hmm. And so one of the one of the one of the legs on, on the stool of statesmanship is you do have to have some type of knowledge and be really good at the concept of politics. Right. But it's not the only thing. Politics, being a good politician does not make you necessarily a good statesman, okay. but a good statesman does have the characteristics and, and understands politics and policy. Mm -hmm. You just have to. Uh, so I just want to make sure that we mention that. Before I move on, were you the first female mayor for Gilbert? 
No, I wasn't. Um, I got to stand on the shoulders of other women, one of whom was appointed by her council. So she served two years, Maggie Kathy. And then there was an elected woman named Cynthia Dunham. Uh, who did fantastic things for Gilbert. So prior to me, I think, and the Gilbert Historical Society, I think did some research. I think I may have been the youngest mayor that was ever elected in okay. Gilbert, but not the first female. Okay. So I was like, wait, I have to ask this. Yeah. Um, I know that Sarah Pressler was the youngest mayor. She's the first female mayor of City of Blackstaff. And that. she was the, I believe she's the youngest council person ever elected. Um, but be, between her and Scott Overton, the two of them were like, in their very, very young age when they were elected. <laughs> so when we're talking about this concept of statesmanship, you know, my very first question is, let's discuss an issue that you had to deal with that was highly divisive as a mayor. mayor. And I mean, like, just, you don't maybe necessarily, if you don't want to have to tell us what the issue was, but as a mayor, I'm sure that you dealt with things or at least that one topic, mm -hmm. that yeah. one issue that was just divisive. Yeah. And so let's talk about that and how you managed to get to resolution. Yeah. So um, I'll probably talk about just a topic overall rather than a specific scenario. But for me, zoning cases were the most controversial things that we faced as a council. And there's a lot of work. There are so many steps throughout that process. And so um, I, I always was saddened when there was a controversial zoning case because I knew that no matter what I did, however I voted or whatever the outcome was, someone was leaving council chambers very disappointed. Mm -hmm. But what I wanted to make sure they never felt was unseen, unheard, or unvalued. And that to me is really sort of the summation of what a, states, a statesman does, statesperson mm -hmm. does. Um, I think they have an, a way to combine technical knowledge, policy, good policy, mm -hmm. politics, and then ensure that the people that they're interacting with are heard, seen, and valued. That to me was the epitome of a statesman. And I'm so grateful I had John Lewis to sort of learn that uh, heard, seen, and valued from. Um, mm -hmm. But I knew that if I met with the residents, if I talked through the issues, I may not be able to get them to a place where they're excited or supportive of a case, but I can ensure that we've checked every box and sort of translated the language of development and zoning into terms that they could then understand and that we could work together on what possible and common solutions are. Um, it's interesting because I do a lot of that now in my daily, daily life here as a, as in my, let's a version 2.0 of Jen Daniels. Um, I used to wish that somebody spoke, you know, developer, staff member, council member, zoning attorney and resident, because I felt like a lot of what we were doing was communicating and, and working hard to communicate, you know, the different, different languages amongst those five groups of people. And it's fun because I get to do that still, but um, you know, making sure that every person in the room has something that they can contribute to the conversation and that it's valued in that group. And I think it comes down to respect. Yeah. How do I show respect for people, particularly people that have a different viewpoint or um, a different perspective that I will never be able to, to have, um, you know, COVID, I was the mayor when, when COVID hit and, of course, that's probably been, you know, one of the most difficult challenges probably for anybody in any leadership position, whether you're leading a company or whether you're leading a community, whether you're leading a police department, like whatever it was, those are very, it was a very difficult time because of how many factors were unknown to us. Yes. Right? We just, we just, I mean, mm -hmm. I remember uh, Mary, as you and I were on conference calls every other day getting new information, updated information that now contradicts information that we got the, the, the call before. Yeah. Um, so just trying to process and then translate all of that information into what it means for a community. Um, that was a huge challenge as well. But it, at the end of the day, it comes back to making sure that our residents uh, really are part of the process. So, yeah. No, yeah, you brought up COVID and I was like, oh, yes. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> Those we, have long days. 
to yeah. just talk about, just to talk about that experience. You also said something else that I think is very important, you know, to making sure that everybody feels valued, respected, and heard. Right? Those were the three things. And um, I was sitting here thinking, you know, I think that that is something that's key. Mm-hmm that people feel valued, respected, and heard. Um, because a lot of times you have to say no, yeah. especially like with zoning cases, mm-hmm. you know, there are like state laws that govern certain things and, you know, there's certain things you can't ask for. And it's one of those things like, can you give this? Um, you know, we're a, we're a, a, we're a property rights state, mm-hmm. but being able to articulate that in a way that people feel respected, valued, and heard like their opinion was heard, right? So even if you're going to say no, because in a lot of cases you have to say no, yeah, right. At least they didn't walk away thinking you didn't hear them, yeah. Um, and I think that's key. You know, I tell people, or at least I told people, I still tell people this. You know, as mayor, and this is why I also wanted to focus on mayors. You know, right before we came on, we were talking about. I was like, I really think if mayors were in charge of the world, we would have it done. And <laughs> and I feel I say that like you know being funny, but I really do mean that. Because mayors, um, you have to talk to 51% of the people or more. Mm-hmm. You don't get to be mayor with like one third of the vote. Yeah. <laughs> you be mayor because 50% plus voted for you. Mm-hmm. Right? Um, and I think that mayors instinctively know that you have to talk to everyone. Yeah. Um, that means the people that agree with you. That means you're also going to go to these meetings where you know that you're not, you know, they're not your fan club. Yeah, you're going there because you also represent them. You know, you represent the people who voted for you. You represent the people who did not, and you represent the people who could not. Yeah, and 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 you do so in a way where they feel respected, listened to, and heard. Right. Yeah, Yeah, absolutely. You know, it's interesting. One of the things that I probably didn't really realize um, until after I was out of office, and that was that the ability to hold tension is is really a skill and an art. And it was something that I didn't, I think it was more, you know, I was um, sort of reflecting back on my time as mayor and, and what is one of those skills that I was able to gain that I didn't have at all before. And it was really that ability to hold tension, to allow people to get to where we all need to be by holding that space for them. And it, it meant that, you know, you had to hear sometimes very passionate alternate mm-hmm. views to help people understand where the middle is. And of course, there's a time to stop the dialogue and knowing when to stop the dialogue, you know, but making sure that there is a, a certain level of decorum and respect in the conversation, but holding those alternative viewpoints, passionate alternative viewpoints and allowing that to just sort of settle so that we can get to a better outcome. And um, it's just one of those things that I've, been watching and and I have great respect for for leaders who can do that. It's something I definitely want to um, get even better at. You know, I hadn't heard it described as that before. I love that definition of it because you're right. It's holding the tension, holding the room, making holding the space, mm-hmm. making sure that the people that are speaking are interacting within that space yeah. are also being respectful, but mm-hmm. allowing them to get out what it is that mm-hmm. they need to say. You know, I sometimes look at stuff and I and I sit back and I watch it. I'm like, you know, if you had to just let that person say what it is they wanted to say two weeks ago, just giving them the time to just get it out, we wouldn't still be here today yeah. having the conversation. It's mm-hmm. like they haven't got a chance to say what they needed to say. Right, right. Yeah. So I like the way you put that. Mm-hmm. So let's talk about how you brought all these parties together, right? So you're holding the space. People are being divisive you know, how do you get people, and this is an interesting conversation too, right? Because you're not going to get everybody yeah. all the time for every reason, mm-hmm. but how do you get the to, not the totality, but the, not the bulk, but how do you get the people, the majority that you need to say, okay, you know, I got some things I wanted. I got some things I didn't want. We're what we'll, we're ready to move forward now. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I think it starts with vision for your community. Um, and a well-articulated vision for what you want your community to be. So when you're leading with that, long before there's ever a zoning case or or a controversial item that comes up in your community, you already know the direction that you're leading the community and you're 
you, you've worked hard to ensure that that vision is, has really permeated throughout the organization. The mayor doesn't generally develop that all on their own. It's in collaboration with the council, particularly in a place like Arizona, where you have, you know, the weak mayor form of government. We're working directly with city managers and others, and we're crafting this vision for our community. And it's meant to be fluid. It's meant to be living just like your community is a living thing, which means when you get new information, you make adjustments and you pivot and, and you find other ways to accomplish, you know, that, that same vision, but really have to have a, a, a solid vision. Um, once you have that solid vision and you're, you're, you're moving the organization through that process, when you have something that's controversial that comes up, it's so important for you to have a conversation about what you want the community to be and that there's lots of different ways to get there. This mm -hmm. zoning case, for example, is one way for us to get there, which is why I would like to support it. Or I don't think this gets us closer to our goal. And that's why I'm going to not support it. Um, and just being very articulate about starting with that vision. Um, it's interesting. And I, and I, I thought about this too, and, and I reserve the right to be wrong. That's always my caveat when I have a hypothesis, right? But I think if we talk about really small things, our community talks about really small things. And it's easy to find differences of opinion when it comes to small things. Do you like ash trees or do you like pine trees, right? Like mm. if somebody has an opinion, they're going to tell you what it is. And now all of a sudden you've sort of created polar, you know, yeah. polar polarized groups. However, if you're talking about here's what we really need and want in our community, and here's what we want it to feel like, and here's what we want it to resemble. Here's the, here's, here, you know, whether it's employment or it's quality of life or, you know, efficiencies throughout our community, and, you know, pick, pick your, pick your passion, I, I guess. And we talk about those things in broad terms, then it's a lot easier to find solutions because we're meeting a broader objective. But if I'm talking specifically about, you know, I need eight feet for, th th there's no room for dialogue. Um, yeah. There's no room for there to be movement on either side. And so, you know, speaking about it that way and then realizing that my way might not be the best way. There's a, an element of humility there. And am I open to other ways to accomplish that same goal? Um, and that's when you bring in all the brains that are way smarter than, than mine uh, to figure that out. I absolutely love that. You know, um, if you talk about small things, you're going to be focused on small things. Mm -hmm. yeah. if you talk about the vision of the community and moving it forward. You're going to be focusing on the vision of the community and moving it forward. And once you know what the vision mm -hmm. looks like, then you can add things, put things in that further the vision, because you know it might not all look the same for everybody, but at the end of the day, it's furthering the vision. I think that's a good way to talk about how you bring people together and you make open sure up the door for everyone's best ideas, right? You just opened it up for people to feel safe to contribute. Mm -hmm. Absolutely love that. And I think that, that that's something that can even translate into like our own personal lives, quite frankly, right? If you focus on these little things, then you're going to get stuck on these things, you know, you be at, what is it? They call it the 30,000 foot level, right? That's where it's a policy level. It's like, what does this policy look like and how is it shaped? Yeah. Yeah, no, I totally see that. And it's interesting too, because Carl, how many emails did we get as mayors that were like, I really am mad because of this, this, and this, right? Or I used to joke that if I went to the grocery store, I for sure was gonna hear about somebody's least favorite intersection in all of Gilbert, right? Like <laughs> that was like a guaranteed. But a lot of times I would turn it back to the resident and say, I heard you, I, I sense that the, you know, you're passionate about this or I, you know, and sometimes I could even share, um, you know, I, I too share this frustration with you. Um, what are some of your suggestions? for solving this and to see them shift from pointer to yeah. collaborator, helper, community member. Um, it did something really magical to their brains, like, and, and to mine too, I was able to see things from a whole new perspective. And I always knew the people that emailed me back with ideas and contribution, those were the community members I wanted to continue to engage with and surround myself with.
And it was okay if they came back and said, I just can't think of one. I'm hoping you can help me. Right. Like it does yeah. change the dialogue a little bit, but um, I think, you know, ensuring again, that that citizen voice is, you know, contributing to solutions and not just pointing them out. It gives them some ownership also in the process. I think that's key, right? The concept of ownership, you know, um, I will tell everybody, it's like, Hey, council is made up of the people for the people by the people. And that, you know, it's one thing to help somebody get elected all day, every day. Of course, we need people to help candidates, right. you and I, people, you know, get elected. Of course, we love that. But I do think that there's a disconnect in some ways in where you have this full team that works with the candidate and gets the candidate elected. And then they're like, okay, you're good. And they just step back. And I would tell people, no, actually this is when the real work starts mm -hmm. because that candidate that's now an elected official is going to need assistance, right? Mm -hmm. So that intersection that you brought up, the person might have no clue about the intersection, but we have some really good staff members that do, but maybe there needs to be more creative thought put into it. Mm -hmm. So where is this committee of people that helps, you know, yeah. that kind of stuff. I think, I really do think we do a disservice when you have you have a group that helps people get elected, but then they step back like you got it from here. Yeah. They resurface in two years at the next election or in four years at the next election. And they're just solely disappointed because certain things didn't happen. Yeah. And you're like, first of all, you know, it takes a majority. So that one person wasn't able to do it by themselves. Right. It takes a majority. And it also takes public will mm -hmm. to help move some things forward. Yeah. Yeah. No, I couldn't agree more uh, with that statement. I did nothing alone as a mayor. Not Let's one see. thing did I do alone. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, it's not lost on me that, you know, people, it was, it was people that came to my aid, uh, whether it be staff who, you know, brought something incredible and creative or whether it was another council member who, you know, maybe didn't agree with me, but caught the vision and decided that they would support a particular, you know, item that I was passionate about. Um, and then, you know, the citizens who, you know, gave me feedback sometimes when I didn't always want it I, uh, or, or, or helped me see where I was missing, missing the mark. And, and thankfully, um, people to help me translate that into good policy. I remember when I first got on council and we're going to talk about this in a little bit. Right. But I was one of those people that was on council because there was an issue. And then, of course, the issue was solved. So before I even got on council, council fixed the issue. But I was already elected. So I'm like, OK, I got to learn everything else real quick. Yeah. Because I didn't know all the stuff that council did. Oh my but God. I remember I brought something up to council and I thought it was so easy. It was the like simplest thing. And it was like a 6-1. And I'm like out there by myself as the one. And I was just like dumbfounded. Yeah. My first item I brought up. And so I, I get off the dais and I'm just like, like totally just like bummed. Mm -hmm. And this one council member comes up and it's like, what's up, Evans? And I'm like, hello, you know, like just totally yeah. lost. And it didn't, I didn't just lose. It was like, a, it was a six one. Definitive, yeah. He looked at me straight in the face and he was like, you need to learn how to count. <laughs> and, I like, and I was like, and it took me a while. But then after that, I was like, you know what? Before I even went up there, I should have had some kind of research done. I should have at least talked to one other council member. There's different rules. So you can't talk to a majority before you get there for good reason. But I should have at least gone and talked to one other council member about this great idea that I had to see mm -hmm. if it was really a great idea or if there's some tweaks that could be made or if it had been tried before, right? Right. Or I even, and then I should have had some, some community members that were interested in it before I just rolled out. And, and so it was interesting because he just looked me straight in the face. He's like, you need to learn how to count. Mm -hmm. That's your problem. He goes, yeah. he goes, he goes, he goes, you're good, but you're going to need to learn how to count. Well, it sounds like uh, you learned quick because I know you were very <laughs> successful at what you did. I learned very quick. I was a quick <laughs> study. Yeah, so let's talk about this concept of activism. Um, because, you know, part of my research and I want to be, I want to put a disclaimer here. Okay. I think it's very important. Everyone knows, or they should know, that Coral came into politics as an activist. And so um, my research had to do with some of the nuances that I saw 
along the way, right? I was in office almost 13 years. Mm -hmm. And so as looking back and stepping back, and I write about this in my dissertation about some of the things that I approached as an activist once I was an elected official, that if I had to go back and do it over, I would not have approached as an activist. Mm -hmm. I would approach as the elected official that I think the community really needed. Mm -hmm. and, and I say that with the, with the understanding that I feel like the world needs activists. Mm -hmm. I feel like activists are the ones that point out something that the rest of us haven't seen that we might have missed, yep. that we're over here putting out this fire and we're not even aware that this is burning down, right? So I want to be very clear with anybody who's listening. I am not saying that we do not need activists. Mm -hmm. I think that we need activists. I would have a conversation on what's good activists and what's a bad activist, but I really don't think that there's even that. I think people who are acting as activists are acting out of a passion for whatever it is. And I think that that's always rooted in good. And maybe mm -hmm. that's just simplifying it, but that's how I feel. If you have people who are willing to get out in the rain, write a cardboard sign, stand out there, write letters, be an activist for something, it's because they really see a problem and they mm -hmm. really see a need for change. So that's, we're not here to disc or take away from that. But I we're not here to disc or take, take away from that. And there's a period, not even a but, a period. Okay. There is a difference though, between policy making and quite frankly, a statesman and the activist. I do think that the statesmen have some, or they learn how to use some activist tools perhaps, but they are not activists. And so I wonder if you would consider that to be, I wonder how you define activism and if there is a difference between statesmanship and activists. And I want to see, I want to make sure we saw me jump from state, from activists over to statesmanship. I want to go back and talk about the elected official in the middle, right? Sure. Um, but what do you think about that? So first of all, I'm super grateful for activists. Um, it, I've seen, you know, different waves or variations of the activist um, throughout my time, specifically as an elected official. But what I know when there's an activist that's, you know, fired up about something, I know that they are passionate about our community. And that to me is a gift. Can you imagine the community where everyone is just resigned? And, and you see this in a lot of you know, um, particularly communities that sort of already had their heyday and are, you know, in a redevelopment phase where you see a lack of passion for your community. Um, I really think we need to shift um, our some of our thinking uh, around activists. A lot of uh, elected officials that I knew so, know sort of see them as a thorn in their side or something to deal with mm -hmm. instead of seeing it as really a gift to the community on some level. Mm -hmm. um, the thing that concerns me most about the activism that we see today, um, and I do think it's different than historic activism, yeah. is that as soon as something is fixed, they go away. Mm. And the fix may not be in the best interest of the community long term. And, and that's the part that I always like in a desire to make, let's make this problem go away, right? Right. Um, I think about some of the water issues like in Jackson or, you know, Flint, Michigan, or like there's, I mean, we could, we could name off lists of cities that just wanted a problem to go away. And what you end up doing is you end up doing a quick fix without a thoughtful fix. Um, and there's a difference between sort of buying time and then continuing to work on the issue versus just make it go away, make it stop, you know? Make the people stop yelling at me, um, make our meetings shorter, uh, like whatever it is, rather than actually addressing the core of the problem. And I think in our and, and I'll probably just put a blanket statement on it. I think in our country, we treat a lot of symptoms without treating what's at the core of the problem. Um, and I always think of sort of that medical analogy, right? Like mm -hmm. um, we really need to to take a different look at, I'll say, problems or challenges within our community. Um, if an activist is passionate about something, it merits us to listen and then to deconstruct what the passion is, is really about. Um, and at the end of the day, I think it almost always comes down to feeling disenfranchised, mm -hmm. feeling ignored, 
feeling like they don't have a part in the decision-making process, that they don't have a voice because activists are oftentimes representing a larger group who, you know, might be busy raising their family and just doing their job or, you know, making sure their kids are, you know, getting a leg up or, you know, whatever it is, um, activists are, are highlighting for us something that we really need to deconstruct in our own communities. Um, and I, I hate com like the, I hate committees in a lot of ways because uh, it seems like the slowest form of government when we just create a subcommittee of the council or create. So I put a caveat there that yes, we need lots of people at the table, but they need a very defined scope of work and they need a timeline. Mm -hmm. And we cannot do this sort of open-ended, um, you know, uh, open-ended dialogue. It will go on forever. And homelessness is a perfect example of that. We have been having homeless committees and subcommittees and things like that for years. It is a very complicated, very nuanced challenge for us. Mm -hmm. um, for everyone, you know, but I do think that we haven't really ever deconstructed the actual problem because it's so uncomfortable for us. Um, yeah. So, you know, it's interesting that you brought that up um, because I remember um, here in Flagstaff, we were having the conversation about homelessness. Mm -hmm. And um, again, as we've stated, you need the activists. Because the activists are going to be like, hey, this is a major issue. I'll need to pay attention to it. Mm -hmm. um, one of the solutions that, that they came up with was because uh, we have a no camping on city property ordinance. Mm -hmm. here. Mm -hmm. They're like, well, we just need to raise the ban and people can just um, camp in the park. Um, and then there was the idea that we take this one street and we say people can just park here in the street. This is this is designated camping, sleeping or car. Urban camping zone, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, the chief of police came in. We brought him in, and he was like, "That's the worst idea ever." He's like, "Because yes, this is happening in other places, but the level of crime is so high mm -hmm. in these areas because of you know homelessness and the reason why people are homeless. There's a whole bunch of different different yeah. reasons, right? Very and so cool. you have a very varied population. So they're like, "This is not a good idea." They're like, you might have like a single parent with their kiddos camping in a car right next to somebody in another car that they necessarily shouldn't be next next door to, right? Um, and I remember that the, this this particular group was really adamant. Yeah. And they were like, you just don't care about homeless people. You just don't understand. And I remember looking at that and, and I said it out loud. I mean, I said it there at the dais. I go, if this is really about addressing the issue of homelessness, then what we need to do is look at our current shelter service and maybe consider expanding it because if there's X amount of people outside the shelter that need sheltering, if it's because you can't keep families together, it's because you know the, the, the male child is now 13, we need to look at those types of issues. I go, because what this is or what it appears to be is a feel good mechanism. So you wanna do something that feels good. So now people can just camp wherever. And then we're going to step back like we fixed the problem. I know we haven't fixed the problem at all. We've just allowed them to camp in public spaces or to camp on this road. And a good way to look at that would be Skid Row in um, Los Angeles, right? Where they're allowing people to camp in a certain area, where they put certain services and stuff there. But the extreme poverty and everything else that's happening is actually a disservice and did not, at the end of the day, address the underlying, like you said, the underlying yeah. issue. Yeah. It just allowed people to step back and say, we feel better about ourselves because we did something. Right, right, yeah. I also think we're often trading problems. Um, I'm sort of one of those people that's like, I have this set of problems and I'm actually willing to trade those in to try something else. And I'm gonna end up with a different set of problems, but you, know, you kind of are constantly figuring out which problems you want to trade and what you're really comfortable with. It's not to say we can't solve problems, but it can take a lot of iterations of trading mm -hmm. problems to get to what the real core solution is. Um, and I do think, you know, we have to put people at the heart of everything that we do as elected leaders. And so that means that 
individual who's mentally ill, we have to put them at the heart of the solution. And the mother who has lost her job and is a single mom now living in her, we have to put her at the center of the solution. The individual who is choosing to live a certain lifestyle on the street for whatever the reason may be, we also need to put them at the heart. And those three different scenarios we, we blank it all together as being ho the homeless population, but yeah. there are very different solutions for each set. So if we can sort of remove those barriers and really look at the individual circumstance and as a community, and you know, we, we, we get pretty good at this, right? Like we have a whole toolbox right. of solutions. I need options because each one of these is unique and different. Yeah. Um, and that there's a creativity level to that. Um, that's why we need the artists and the and and that population to be at the table too, right? The different skill set. Yeah. And and I loved the idea of creating interdisciplinary teams. If you only have the police at the table to solve homelessness, it's really only going to be done one way. But if you have, you know, the service provider, the 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 average resident if you have the the police there as well but then you have the public works team you know yeah. who's in it, it, and you create these interdisciplinary you're going to be able to come up with much better long-term lasting solutions yeah you are i like the way you describe that too you know i hadn't thought about interdisciplinary but you're right you know you put everybody at the table mm -hmm. including the person who's homeless you know different yeah. stages of homelessness someone who has been right someone who's newly and say how would we fix this if we were going to fix it yeah. you know um because it takes everybody at the table yeah. because everybody has a little piece of the solution mm -hmm. and certain people have direct knowledge of what is ha actually happening yeah. you know uh, one of the things that i think is is interesting you know when it comes to being an activist um and one of the things that I found out was that as an activist, to me, right, and I won't speak for myself, I didn't have to care about everybody else's problems, mm. right? So, you know, when I came into office here in, in Flagstaff, there was an old school. It had been a black segregated school. Um, it was desegregated almost two years before Brown versus the Board of Education. Mm. Um, somehow the city ended up with it and it was a youth center for a while and it was closed, right? And then, you know, fast forward several years and now the city's going to tear it down because of bond override. And the community is like, but you promised that to us for a community center. And this is a historic building and this is why. So, you know, knee deep in this fight, like we have to save this um, this, this building. So, you know, the election happens in, um, and that time it happened in May. And then right before council went on, um, what is it, break, mm -hmm. right? They saved the building. So then, you know, you come back and you get sworn in. And the issue that you got on council for is completely, I mean, it's already been solved, right? And so when I was being an activist, though, that was the only thing I had to care about. I didn't have to care about the, 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 the bond override had to do with the senior center. Mm -hmm. There wasn't enough money to fix the senior center. So that's why they're trying to sell a building. Well, I didn't have to worry about the senior center because I'm worried about saving this building. Yeah. And I didn't have to worry about the police and fire budget. You know, I'm trying to save this building and I don't have to worry about all these little pieces. So then I end up on council and it was like, I'm here for four years. <laughs> you know, like, what am I going to do? Okay. And then it's like, oh, wait, we have public safety. We have roads. There's this water issue that we have. We have libraries. We even have pickleball courts. Like We have like a bunch of stuff yeah. that we're in charge of. Yeah. Right? And it was like, wow. Now I have to care about all this stuff. Yeah. Because the emails that are coming in weren't even about the, the, the center because the center had been saved, right? N they, there was not one email about that. Yeah. It was about all this other stuff. And so that was an awakening to me. Then as I you know moved through my career and I end up as a mayor, and then I end up with a council member who came on um, running. Um, she was really an activist for one issue. She ends up on council and it's like, well, I was elected for this reason. Mm -hmm. I'm like, but that reason's been solved. And we have a whole bunch of other stuff we have to do in the next term. Mm -hmm. And I need you to be passionate about these things. Yep. And so I was like, hmm, karma, karma. I think that was karma. <laughs> 
But how do you feel about these one issue candidates? Because you have people that are running, you know, nowadays I tell people, Hey, it's great. If you are passionate about trees, right. And making sure that we have trees to address the, our carbon footprint. Yeah. It is absolutely, I'm excited that you're passionate about that. But once your candidate t- candidate gets done talking about that, mm-hmm. you need to ask them how they feel about water in rural Arizona. Yeah. Because that's something that they really need to know or care about as well. What do you think about one issue candidates? So they get elected, right? Like I don't have any control over, over who gets elected. I um, have related this several times where, you know, if you, if you're running a professional sports team, you know, you get to pick your team. Um, but if you're running a council, you don't get to pick your team. Uh, the, the, the public does that. And, and the public wanted that individual, right? They, Mm -hmm. and, they have just as much reason to be there as I do. We all got elected by the same people. So I think that's, you know, some, one of the first sort of premises of, hey, you have a lot to offer. Mm-hmm. You clearly have an ability to dig deep into an issue. Here are what I would consider to be all of the other subject matters that we really need to dig into. Which one do you want to be the go-to council person for, right? And um, by dividing those roles and responsibilities based on skill set or experience or passion, I always felt like they took ownership of those things. I had a council member that was particularly interested in economic development and really good at it, you know, and really good at sort of seeing that big picture. I had another one that loved interfacing with the school. She had been, you know, involved in, in that previously, like, yes, go, like, And so I think by dividing up the roles and responsibilities, um, which was the only way that I was able to do it. Remember, I couldn't spend 80 hours a week doing this. I had four kids at home. And so I needed help. And my council knew that. I did not want to be all things to all people, but I want my council collectively to be all things to all Gilbert residents. And and how how can we sort of take that? Now, you, you also can't force them to love any other issues. And I had that experience as well that like, you know, every now and again, you'll get a council member for whatever reason um, just doesn't have the desire or the ability, or perhaps they underestimated how much time and energy is spent giving back to your community in these elected roles for less than minimum wage. Um, and so they just didn't necessarily sort of contribute or what we might consider to be pull their weight Mm -hmm. And what that means is everyone else has to pull a little bit more. Um, And instead of being resentful about that, although there were times that I was definitely that, um, I think I really looked at it as a missed opportunity for them. I knew how enriching the work was for me and for others who put their heart into it. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the day, you know, we're given these titles, these roles for a finite amount of time. Yeah. And the onus is really on us to make the best of those, those years that we have and to really contribute in meaningful ways. Um, and, and, and if somebody chooses not to, um, you know, what a missed opportunity for that individual. And you just kind of have to look at it that way rather than, you know, um, rather than being sort of resentful of, of their lack of contribution. Yeah. I like the way you put the concept of it's a missed opportunity for them right? Because I do think it is. But I also think it's a missed opportunity for their community, Mm -hmm. right? Because, you know, council, um, most cities have seven members on their council. And you usually have seven members that are working at least at a certain level to move things forward, right? So when you have someone who's like a single issue candidate, who's only interested in either this thing or they were interested in that thing, but it was solved before it was solved three months into their four years. Mm-hmm. And then they're just not passionate about anything else. I actually think that hurts the community because yeah. then the community doesn't have its full team on the field for lack of a better word right. that they really need. And so, you know, I've literally been looking at people. I'm like, Hey, you know, I'm passionate about certain things all day, every day. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I go, but I really feel that once you have your candidate who's passionate about that, you might want to ask them about other things yeah, because, because those are things that they're going to have to deal with. Mm-hmm. 
like it or not. So you might want to just kind of let them know, hey, once you get in there, <laughs> water's going to be an issue. Have you guys yeah. thought, have you thought about that? But yeah. I do like the way that you said that it's also a missed opportunity for them as well. Do you think that there's a difference between activism and statesmanship? Um, I do, but I don't think one is actually um, like exclusive of the other. I think in every statesman, there's a level of activist and um, in what I would consider to be the very successful activists, there's generally a level of statesmanship in them as well. Um, so I think it's just about sort of which hat you need to wear at which time. The other thing is campaigns are always, they're always a dichotomy, right? Like they have to be, people have to speak in like really definitive terms. And I remember being slightly overwhelmed by the quantity of gray area once I was actually in office. I was like, wait a minute. <laughs> I thought that it was gonna be very clear that there was either corruption or there wasn't, right? <laughs> like, like and, and, and thankfully, um, you know, I think in, in our communities, you know, we could definitively say that, you know, there's no corruption. However, there are, uh, you know, challenges, I think, as it relates to having sort of that black or white mentality as it relates to a campaign and mm -hmm. how um, most of the solutions that we find are right there in that center area. And, and our, our communities are more polarized. I mean, just politics in general is far more polarized than it was when I started. I can definitely tell you that it's, you know, shifted quite a bit. Um, and what I worry the most is the breakdown of trust between the elected officials and the people they serve. I used to say very often it took years for us to build trust and it would take seconds to lose it. So we better be very, very careful with that, like that, that, uh, that weighed on me quite a bit. Like I want to make sure the community knows that even if they don't like the answer or maybe they don't like me, they're very upset that I woke up and I'm still breathing today. <laughs> that at least They knew that we were a trustworthy group that we meant what we said, that we did what we were gonna say, that our actions matched our words and that we were very open with their, their local government um, to the extent that we, we had that. But I think a statesman um, values that. Mm -hmm. And I think a statesman puts that above all else. You know, um, the concept of trust and it being easily broken, you know, a lot of the issues that we were dealing with had to do with things that happened 10, 15, 20, you know, 50 years ago, yep. right? You had citizens that remember, this is what you said, and this is what you did. Yeah. And, you know, we spent a lot of time having to go back and first listen to make sure that we understood, right? Yeah. Listen to the individual, do the research, bring it back and be like, okay, you know, it's, and to have people tell us, well, this is what you said. It's like, it was very interesting on council because a uh, prior council or a current council, you can't tie the hands of a future council. Don't mind so them. you can't say, you know, the council in 2030 is going to have to do this. You can't say it. You can do an ordinance or you can do a resolution, but even those can be changed by the next council oh. if the council majority wants to, right? And, you know, and then trying to honor what a prior council did but then also realizing that the prior council maybe 50 years ago didn't have the information that you have now. Right. And that the community has moved in this direction. So this resolution needs to be changed. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, but still trying to honor the history that comes with that because you don't necessarily want what, what, want what you're doing as a council in 2022 to be changed by a council in 2050. Right. So there's like little nuances. Yeah. And the respect and the civility um, of who came before and the fact that you're often building, you know, it's interesting that when I came on council, they were cutting the ribbon on the aquaplex and our names were on the plaque. It had zero to do <laughs> with this aquaplex, zero, zero to do with the aquaplex. Yeah. Wasn't even around for the discussion, but happened to be elected at the time yeah. the ribbon was being cut, the right? Being cut, yeah. <laughs> and so understanding that, you're building on something that someone else did. And I think it took them like, I don't know, 10, 15 years to get that done. Right. Right. Yeah. 
Yeah. So I, I love, I love what you're saying, Coral. And I, um, I laugh a little bit. I think my name is on like the vast majority of bathrooms that were built in Gilbert because from 2008 during the downturn of the economy, it was like the only things that we were still building were restrooms. And so <laughs> my kids tease me like, how many, how many names is your, like how many places is your name listed in the town? Um, but that's what I go back to like communities being living, breathing things um, just like us as humans, right? Like the solution for me when I was 18 to feel calm and peaceful is different than the solution that I need at 43 to feel calm and peaceful. I'm a living, breathing thing and I have all these experiences and I have this different understanding. So what I need today is different than what I needed at 18. The same thing with our communities, which is why I think we have a really important responsibility as we are trying to solve problems to say, hey, this is the solution as we see it today. I make no promises for what the future is. But instead, it goes back to A, not being able to hold tension or B, just wanting the problem to go away. Okay, I promise, I promise, I promise. You just want the problem to go away. Um, the, another like quick and easy analogy on this is, um, you know, it wasn't so many years ago that we had to add in airport overlays into real estate paperwork. So when you go to buy a house, if you're in an airport like planning area, you're going to be notified of that. Right. Um, and the reason we had to do that is because people would buy houses and be like, I had no idea that there was an airport over there or that I was in the yeah. flight path. You know, the realtor didn't tell me that or, you know, I wasn't made aware of it. Right. And so we have a responsibility to disclose to our residents like, hey, this is the general plan that we voted on today, but it's a this community is a living, breathing thing. And so we're going to need to make adjustments to that throughout the decade in order to respond to different needs that our community may need. And so uh, so much respect for the people who came before me, even the one who's ordinances I had to clean up, right? And I shudder to think what they'll have to clean up that I did with all the best intentions, mm -hmm. you know, with, with, but I made the best decision with what I knew then. And they're going to know so much more in 10 years and are going to be able to, you know, hopefully clean up the messes that I also inadvertently made. You know, you just had me laughing because I'm talking about the airplane over or the airport overlay. Mm -hmm. One of the first things I got hit at, hit on when I got to council, hit on, that doesn't sound right. One of the first things <laughs> I had to do was, wait, wait, here you go. I walk in and there's a lady who's standing here. I made an appointment with her and she has the regional plan and she's going off about mm -hmm. this development that's coming. I'm like, don't know anything, but like to talk to you. So we're walking up the stairs and at the top of the stairs, was the property owner who happened to hear that I was coming in to talk to somebody and he has the zoning code and it's his personal property. Okay. You know, so then what is it a year later? Cause we're all deep into this. Yeah. The zoning code doesn't, it doesn't match. Right. So, you know, the regional plan says, or the, the general plan says, we're going to have this as open space. And the realtor had told this individual, all this is going to be open space behind your house. Yeah. But nobody purchased it for open space. Right. And so now the guy who owns the property, he's like, that's nice that that's in your general plan, but no one purchased it for me. And I'm getting ready to ex execute my personal property rights. Right. Yeah. So, I mean, those are the little nuances. So I yeah. knew. So from then on, as we start talking about the regional plan, doing stuff, I'm like, hey, whatever goes in here needs to match. And okay. if it doesn't match up or if, if we say we want this for open space in the general plan, then we need to try to figure out what dollars mm -hmm. are associated with it to buy it. Because five, six, seven years down the road, someone's going to get hit with that same, that same, what do you call it? Difficulty because yeah. they don't match and they're two different plans. Right. So oh, when you said that, I'm like, yeah, see those little nuances. All in there. <laughs> had approved, like we had approved because it's approved by the general public, but council had approved it to go to the vote of the people, okay. the general public. And I'm like, this plan is not working with reality on the ground. Yeah. So I know we're winding down on our hour, but there really are um, two things that I, that I think are really important that I really want to hear your answer to. Um, Mayor Daniels. <laughs> I just like calling you Mayor Daniels. I like too much responsibility. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, no, I don't do that. Um, so the two things I want to ask, and I'll ask both of the questions at one time and let you kind of noodle over it. Um, 
what does the role of empathy, if any, um, play in the concept of statesmanship? And is statesmanship something that you just have to be born with? Or is it something that you can grow into? It is it a skill that you can learn? Um, we have a lot of great politicians. Mm -hmm. We don't necessarily have a, a, a lot of great statesmen, right? So as you think about those two those two questions that I kind of just bundled, yeah. what role does empathy play in the concept of statesmen, if any? And do you just have to be born a statesman, or can you actually develop the skills? So I think statesmen become that way because of a diversity of experiences. I think it's actually a grown skill and I think anybody can have it. Um, I have a growth mindset, so I like to think that I'll be all the things later that I'm not today that I really want to be. Uh, so I'm going to sort of leave that there. I, um, I think that it takes practice. And oftentimes we elect people, um, myself included, and give titles without actually growing the skill set that makes the biggest difference. Um, and so I just think we need to give more tools and resources to newly elected officials at all levels of government. Um, it's a little bit more difficult in this day and age. Uh, but I do, I do think that, that it's a, it's a skill set that can be grown. I also think it's very unique to the individual's strengths. So while I might be a statesman when it comes to, you know, collaboration and finding ways for people to work together, I might be less of a statesman when it comes to my own kids and running my own household. And so I'm just very aware of the fact that, you know, situationally, uh, it does matter. Um, I think empathy is um, one of the highest characteristics that we can aspire to, to be an empathetic person and to be somebody who deeply cares for um, others. Uh, I think it might be more of a lost art than uh, what I would prefer that we had in this world. But that's the great thing about having been a mayor is I got to see so many acts of empathy and kindness and generosity from a really unique perspective. It was such a gift to be able to see the community in that way. Were there hard things? And did I see lots of people that weren't empathetic or helpful? Yes, of course I saw that too. But my preference will always be to focus on the people who um, are looking out for others who are extending themselves to the point of being uncomfortable in order to try to understand a perspective that they don't have. Um, I think about this a lot, particularly as it relates to people in maybe different socioeconomic classes. Maybe it's different races than me. Maybe it's a different education level than me. Um, I will never, ever be able to see the world through their lens, ever. Doesn't matter how many experiences I have, Mayor Evans, I will never be able to see the world through your lens. But I have respect for the way that you see the world through your lens. And I think therein lies the empathy. That's the ability for us to give space, to give grace to the way that somebody else sees the world. Um, because my way can't be the only way. When COVID hit and I had, you know, like you, hundreds and hundreds of emails from people who were so confident that they knew how we were supposed to handle a pandemic. And I remember sitting there one night going, how are all of these people so sure that they have the answers? How I feel like I'm getting daily, hourly updates sometimes. I'm working with our schools and with our churches. I'm working with our first responders. I'm working with our hospitals. I'm working with the health department at the county and the state. I'm getting all of this information. And I don't know what the right answers are. I fully will admit I do not know what the right answers are. My whole goal in that was just do the next right thing. Whatever that is, just do the next right thing. I'm not going to be able to solve this for my community, but I just need to like take incremental steps to do the next right thing. And I felt sad at the end of the day for the people who thought that they had all the answers because they were missing so many of the lessons in the process. The process of learning how to be empathetic to someone else's situation. For example, the neighbor who's suffering from cancer and literally cannot leave them their house without risk. 
they can no longer leave their house without serious risk to their health. Or the senior citizen who is now basically in a lockdown situation without contact to the outside world, you know, and, 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 and most of our seniors that were living in senior living facilities, they haven't been there that long and they had to give up a ton of their personal freedoms in order to move into a facility and be cared for by another. So that lack of independence, like I, it was those situations that I feel like the people who thought they had all the answers, right or wrong, they may have all been right. And I was, the, you know, but the people who think they have all the answers miss the opportunity to give space and respect to the person whose lens they will never see. And um, I, what I can all be wrong all day long in order to be able to give space for that individual's perspective. And um, I always say like, one, it's okay for people to be wrong about me. And two, uh, what people think about me is none of my business. Even when they want to tell me, my job is to do the best that I can with what I have where I am and to be really open to their learning. And that takes empathy for others, including people who are definitive about, you know, how to solve any problem that we have in our community. You know, you said that so beautifully. <laughs> when he said, I don't, I will never know what it's like to be you. So I'm going to give you the benefit of being the expert. <laughs> That's really what I heard. I heard you say that I'm going to give you the space to talk about what it is that you know firsthand that I don't know, right? Yeah. I'm going to give you the respect of being the expert in that because I don't know what it's like. Mm -hmm. And I think that right there is key, really. Yeah. And I think if we if we spent more time in that realm, we would we would really understand that we have so much more in common yeah. than we ever have, you know, not in common. Yeah, I agree wholeheartedly, wholeheartedly. If you think about how many things you vote on as a council too, just like the number, like think about consent agenda, think about like all the things that you're voting on, what you disagree on is such a small percentage of the work that you do. Mm -hmm. uh, we did, we had two, we counted one time, we had did a whole like deep dive on our lines of service that our community offered. We offered 267 lines of service, different lines of service to our community. So how many of those lines of service, the things that matter the most to our residents, how many of those things do we really disagree on as a community? Very, very few. Very, very few. Yeah. And so I just think that, you know, we have to remember that. Well, it looks like our time is definitely winding, winding down. I see that uh, Dr. Lewis is somewhat back on the screen. Um, I just want to say, Mayor Daniels, how much I absolutely enjoyed this conversation with you. Likewise. Thank you so much. It's really fun I'm, to connect with you again. I'm going to ask you to uh, reserve some time um, in a future uh, podcast. I'd like to have you join myself and a couple of other mayors. Um, as we continue to vet this particular um, this particular topic, uh, again, I think that you summed up so beautifully um, what it means to, um, to have empathy for your community and what it means to be a statesman. Thank you. And thanks for teaching me along the way. I really appreciate that. Likewise. And so with that, we are going to end our wonderful hour, just over an hour tonight, with Mayor Jen Daniels from Gilbert, Arizona. And we will be back um, in November with our next podcast. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Bye. <laughs>